How do you pray, Pat? Uh, um, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to stump you. I... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> my, well, anyway, it's, it's morphed. I'm not, don't consider myself a very great prayer. Um, uh -huh. And never been disciplined about it, which is typical of me. I'm not disciplined about anything. But um, lately, it's getting simpler. <laughs> it's just, uh, and I've, I guess all along, even before I entered the Jesuits, I used to just sit in, and nobody else, none of my buddies did that, but I'd sit in there before ball games and stuff and just look at the tabernacle, and I could feel him. Um, Jesus, you know. So I guess I've always had that, uh, you know, sometimes more aware <laughs> than others. And then sometimes he really lets me know he's there. Um, but uh, I think now, <laughs> my, I, uh, I look out the window. <laughs> I just, I, I get a coffee because I'm comatose in the morning. I do my little morning workout and I to wake up a little bit and then I have some coffee. And then I, I have a little balcony and I have trees and flowers and all this stuff out there. And then I have outside, luckily, I have trees and things that remind me. I sort of forget I'm in the city. And, um, and I can see the sky mount. And I, I just look. Yeah. And... Uh, Somehow I, I'm not attracted to pick up a scripture. Uh, one of my mentors, <laughs> one of my mentors, Pat O'Leary said, uh, who's one of the finest men ever, as you know. <laughs> yes. And he, I, he, could, he, could hand, he could go with me, which I don't think everybody could. But he said, uh, so you don't, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't read the scriptures <laughs> or you don't, because that's pretty normal. I read the Psalms or something, and yeah. I said, no, um, I just look out the window. <laughs> and, and then he laughed, and he said, oh, yeah, okay. And then I said, sometimes the great thing is sometimes I understand something or something comes to me. And then the, the big gift is sometimes words come to me. And, and uh, he said, well, you are the Psalm then. I mean, you're... You're writing the psalm because it's all about the spiritual world. So that's what I write about. And um, so he said, you're not reading them, you are them. You're just being one. You're responding to, the, to this, all the living ones and then seeing an unseen world and then responding to the presence of, of the Christ in it and the Spirit. And, the Holy Ones, and everything's there, so I've learned that everything's there, and then you are it. So don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about getting any reading done, because I never can get past, our, you know, our, our favorite one that we share is, uh, I was helpless, so he loved me from the song. I love that. I could say that over, that's all I need. And then the other one is, you know me. Another song, you know me. You know when I sit and stand. You know when I fall down. Mm -hmm. Even if I fled to the edge of the sea, you'd be there, you know, holding me. And I don't need anything else. I just don't. I don't know what else, <laughs> what else there is. <laughs> At this point, it's just beautiful. And the words that are given to you, um, would you, at times, um, use those in writing or in a talk that you're going to give? Yeah, they show up. And I think the Spirit, I, I can't generate them. He just gives me the opening line. <laughs> or he gives me a couple of lines. Sometimes I wake up with them. And I say, well, I'm given these words for some reason. First of all, I enjoy trying to write them, follow the lead. And then sometimes I go on for a bit. And then never very long. And then uh, it does show up. 
sometimes then somebody will ask me to talk and or I, I do I'm working on another book so uh <laughs> slowly <laughs> but eventually and then I can share that with them uh, it's like from my heart mm-hmm. and it's all <clears throat> an appreciation of of the folks mainly mm-hmm. and their spiritual way mm-hmm. you know is that what your books are about I mentioned two yeah. books uh in the introduction mm-hmm. that you've written could you just say a little bit about those books what 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 is what are those books about? They came to me. I was supposed. To, I'm always supposed to be doing something else in my life, and then I do something different. And I was supposed to be making a 30-day retreat, and I started having. <laughs> started having this book, and it, and it just started coming, and then, and I thought, oh God, well I'm supposed to be doing something else here, some kind of a meditation or something, but these words are just flowing and. So I started writing them, and then I went to Joe Conwell, who's my spiritual father, <coughs> and, and I said, uh, you know, <laughs> I sort of feel guilty, but I, I'm getting all this, it's all coming to me, and it was all about uh, the spirituality of the plateau, where I was staying there, because I was Colville Res in my early days, and um, the sayings and teachings, and then how it fits together with our our. You know, our way of looking at things you know, through the sacraments and our way of praying and how does it all go together? Well, it's all coming, and it, it's just given to me. Hmm. And, and then he said, well, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> you know, go ahead. Just write, you know. Were you in uh, the Jesuit uh, part of our formation called Tertianship at that time? Yeah, the last formation is their last shot at me. Okay. Trying to straighten me up. Uh-huh. And, uh, it's, you know, a lot of meditations and quiet. And, yeah. well, then I just started. <laughs> and But he knew that by then already, I'd only been with the people f- four years, five years, or six, about five years then. He already knew I was obsessed with Indians. Uh, they were all I ever thought about mm-hmm. was the people. And even being separated them for that amount of time was just hell for me. I wanted to get back because I knew my people stuff was going on. That was part of the struggle of my retreat. And um, it just drives me crazy if I can't be with them, especially when it's horrible things are happening sometimes. And um, um, he was wise enough. And other guys went on, you know, to learning experiments, and they are, these are all university guys, mm-hmm. and for the most part, some were in white parishes. But they were, and I said, Joe, you know, I do this all the time. That's my life. That's not an experiment for me. <laughs> I said, I know, I know. Yeah, I said, but I could I just do the book? Wow. And he said, Yeah, do the book. Yeah. And that was the book beginnings. Yeah. yeah. No, that one was finding oh. a way home. Oh, okay. And. Uh, uh, the spirituality of the plateau, native peoples, and uh, the Catholic. And it was meant to be like a catechism for the young. Mm-hmm. Because when I went to the res, I realized all the catechisms act as if these people had no spiritual history. Mm. Just the advent of the black robes onward, you know, and then learning the Catholic stuff. So everything's that way. Mm-hmm. The black robes being the Jesuits, the, the Jesuits, term for the Jesuits in the Northwest, yeah. who really had their place with the people. Mm-hmm. But what about mm-hmm. you know the twelve thousand years before mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. where this their whole spirituality was being passed down and refined, and mm-hmm. and you could only pick it up gradually from the teachings. I'm not an anthropologist or a historian. I'm not that disciplined, and uh, I learned everything just sitting with elders. You know, you're having tea, and they'll. I can't ask them questions, because they won't say anything. But if I'm sitting there and they look at me and they think, well, he probably wants to know something, <laughs> and then they'll help me. They'll say something, and then I can't ask any more questions. But so I get it. I got it gradually. I didn't ever read history or anthropology or ethnology. I learned it purely straight on first, and it's still the same for me. I learned everything straight on. Yeah, it has to come from them. Um, could you say a little mm. bit more about how the Jesuits' relationships with the indigenous communities 
maybe has changed uh, over time and how the Jesuits understand what it is, you know, what that relationship is and what they're doing maybe has changed. Yes. Um, I, the Jesuits came from, from Europe because they were getting thrown out of Europe. And, uh, and they were going all over the world. <laughs> You know, South America, North America, Asia, they were going everywhere. And, uh, and they wanted to, and they wanted to give their lives. They wanted to give their lives, you know, trying to spread the word. And, and they understood things in that manner that they needed to do this because if you weren't baptized and if you didn't know about these things, the Catholic way, then, you, you know, you weren't going to go on, you know, weren't going to the next world. Sounds weird to us now. Uh, but that's the way they thought. So they had a real impetus to get the word out and to baptize, go and baptize, you know, from our scriptures and that. So that was their work. And when they came to the Northwest, uh, it was only by strange invitation, really. Uh, they came to St. Louis. And, you know, after St. Louis <laughs> frontier, <laughs> like, oh, my God, there's still so much country left. And uh, they, the three, four delegations of, of Nimipu and Flathead, Interior Salish, came to get, they said, we want you to come, because they'd heard about black robes from the Mohawk traders that came through. They were the first catechists, you know, some other person. So they said, we need a black robe. And then the medicine men had, had visions earlier seeing it coming, there's something coming, a new way, a new understanding. So the medicine people saw it. So they went there to get to Smed, and to Smed, first three, they, they, they didn't send a Jesuit. And then fourth delegation that came 1,500 miles on horseback through a terrifying country where they're lucky to get through alive. Uh, he said, I want to go. I begged the spirits to go, and he went with them. And that's the beginning. Mm. And so from then, like 1848 onwards, we're with them. It's been a marriage. <laughs> I think it's a marriage. Really hard times together. Really good times together. Going through very difficult, very hard times uh, from that time onward. Because their goal, their dream was to be like the Paraguayan reductions uh, to create a buffer, because they knew what was coming. The folks, folks hadn't met, they'd met a few trappers or something, you know, but they didn't know what was coming. They couldn't. And uh, their idea was to form a line of defense, and so they'd be more resistant to that. But there wasn't time, but they, that's why they founded the schools, founded Gonzaga U, for, it was for native people. And they thought education is the buffer, you know, to help them push back. And would, where would these early Jesuits in the mid-19th century have been from? Were they, oh, like, they, where was the Smet from? They were from France and Italy, mm -hmm. Belgium, mm -hmm. mainly, you know, most, mainly those countries. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so... Uh, so what they were trying to provide a buffer from was the United States and its expansion. The colonial expansion. And the colonial yeah. expansion. Yeah. Which, so in a sense, they, they um, in, in a sense, they were outsiders to that, in the, at least in terms of nationality. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, they weren't, they had no love, you read the writings, they had no love for Americans. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> they thought they were not living up to their democratic mm. creed. Uh, they were coming out and just grabbing land and mm -hmm. mowing people down. Mm -hmm. and, and that happened. Mm -hmm. The immigration, flood of immigration just mm -hmm. like a tsunami mm -hmm. over them. And uh, U.S. cavalry, you know, was, mm -hmm. uh, was hammering them and, oh man, it was tough. But then the, the Jesuits stayed right with them mm -hmm. through everything, mm -hmm. everything. They stuck with them. And then, uh, with respect to what you were saying earlier, with re with regard to your book, mm -hmm. you said that catechesis had taken place for a long time. Yeah. 
as though the thousands of years of spiritual teaching and mm -hmm. and, and, and and the way of life had had not had yeah. not existed. Um, so, uh, was there a gradual sort of um, shift in that regard? You know, you're, in your book, you're trying to do something new, which mm -hmm. which, which really takes takes seriously that that yeah. heritage, and, and 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 tries to reflect on the meaning of some some of the Christian uh, themes in 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 light of it. Definitely. Uh, so, so was that a development that had happened? I think. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I was taught first by my mom in that regard, and my father too, that you got to try to reach out of your just narrow mm -hmm. confines of thinking, and mm -hmm. and uh, and people. There's so many other spiritual ways and things to learn, and so I got it from the time I was young. But it was part of me, and and uh, I studied when I was in theology. I wanted to go to India. I wanted to dive into that, and so I did as much as I could in Toronto. But that was all learning for me of, uh, of encountering another uh, spiritual way of life and really encountering it and learning it, you know, learning as best you can. And so without my knowing it, it was preparing me for when I went to Nespelum, I was there as a learner, not a teacher though they let me do things because I'm a priest. But I, it took, after eight years, I remember I was giving a talk to some of the young high school grads, which is always a challenging thing. And um, like they look at you like, you know, what's he gonna say? And I remember in that one, for the first time I felt I was talking, like I made sense to them because I was talking out of their own teachings, mm. not mine. Mm -hmm. but the ones that came down through their grandparents, all the main teachings. And I f started to feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But that's a long process, mm -hmm. a long process. And I think it's just kept evolving. And the Vatican II, of course, opened that world for us in many ways. That, so I didn't feel standing out there naked, you know, trying to do this thing that Vatican II is beginning to do the theology of this outreach to outside of the walls of the church, which mm -hmm. made perfect sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was just fortunate to come at that time. And the people loved that book, and I, I used to just cry. I was so afraid to even show it to them because I thought they might not like the book or it wasn't right. But when they accepted it, I realized we were... You know, our friendship was intact, and they appreciated what I was doing, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was different. And then when I came to the coast, then it even went further, because I was writing there out of uh, that culture and time. And then when I went to the coast, I was with Coast Salish mainly, and that's another spiritual way. Uh, they're both Salish, but a very different spiritual way. And... I was learning, starting over again. So I <laughs> just started over again. And then that, the second book came out of that, uh, Beginnings, A Meditation on Coast Salish Lifeways. But the difference of the books is, one is more has a Catholic matrix, and the other one has, what I hope for, is a Coast Salish matrix. And the church is, this one, the church is big, and part of their, which fit on the plateau. And then on the coast, the, the great reality is their own spiritual way of life. And the church has a part of it. It's in there, they, I mean, because they're open to all. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a different, it's a different shift. Mm -hmm. And that was accepted. Mm -hmm. uh, and always with a, I always tremble when I start handing those things out. <laughs> We mean to the to the native, to the native people. people. You know, yeah. for non-Indian people, yeah. I'm glad if they like it. Uh, but for native people, I like God. I hope you like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, Dean Brackley wrote a book. I can't remember how many years ago now it was. Called the Call to Discernment in Troubled Times. 
and I was thinking, boy, he missed the troubled times by about 10, 10 15 years. Yeah. I'm thinking of the times that we're living in, in now. Yes. You know? Yeah. Troubled times in the country, in the world, in the Catholic Church. Yes. A lot of things could be categorized under the heading of crisis, you know, the environmental crisis, refugee, immigration crises, yes. uh, wealth inequality. Yes. And then just last week, uh, the president, uh, who come, family comes from Germany, uh, told four freshmen, U.S. Congress women of color, yeah. to go back home you know, to their to their countries of course three of them were born here and one was became a citizen i think yeah, when she was yeah. 12. um yeah so so troubled times uh yeah. i think as we speak robert Mueller is testifying yes before congress yes i was watching a little bit of that earlier this morning oh and you can see the just the you know hardening of political uh, stances and, yes. and divisions. So, yeah. I'm just wondering. You mentioned earlier, you know, uh, uh, um, you used the word invis. Did you use the word invisible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. For like the guys naming yeah. men on the streets, men, yeah, or men or yeah. yeah. I was thinking. I was. I was. Thank you for asking me to to celebrate the mass at Chief Seattle Club yeah, this yeah, Sunday yeah, while, yeah. while you were at the Kateri conference. Yeah. But you know, the readings were about hospitality mm -hmm. for this, this past Sunday. Abraham mm -hmm. being hospitable to the three figures yeah. that came, and then the story of Martha and Mary, and, yeah. and, and Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. Jesus is a guest there. Yeah. And so I was thinking, uh, you know, as I was praying over those readings, I knew I would be with the people at the Chief Seattle Club. Yes. The Native American people. Gosh, how absurd it must, all, a lot of this must sound to them, mm -hmm. especially a European. <laughs> yeah. Telling people of color to go back home. Yes. But we don't, at least as far as I can tell in the things that I read in mainstream uh, media or even Catholic media, that that perspective of the native peoples, indigenous peoples, on what's going on doesn't seem to, people don't write about it or people don't. So I'm just wondering, yeah. you know, what um, do you think might be one or two of the more important things that the native life ways, the native mm -hmm. ways of being in the world might have to teach teach us today? Well, it's a very, uh, I really appreciate the question because it, it leads to something fundamentally sad and disappointing, tragic. I, I need sometimes to be culturally specific, which is, I can't generalize, uh, but generally, as we all know, it's been bad. <laughs> it's been bad from the time uh, the pilgrims set foot, and it's been bad since the time the, the Spanish set foot on these lands which they claimed <laughs> as their own they just claim them as their own. This is all for us. And so the original people, and this goes right across both North and South, what happens immediately is they succumb to bugs they've never dealt with their whole lives. And so you can lose 80% of your population and sometimes 100%. And in the Northwest it was at least 80 so that's the first thing that happens. So they're weakened by an enemy, uh, little bugs that their body cannot withstand. Uh, you know, smallpox, influenza, all these things, all the stuff the Europeans had. So that's number one that happens. And then comes the sword and comes the aggression and just gradual taking of everything. So it starts 
like for in America, you know, it starts on the East Coast and it, they start taking and pushing. So gradually you just simply kill them or tolerate them a little bit and then, but eventually you push them. So they're pushed westward all the time. Then they bump into the next tribes. <laughs> so they're all being pushed is the American uh, dream of um, manifest destiny is being acted out with scriptural authority. <laughs> Here we go. And this is the new promised land for these Europeans who were desperate themselves. They came from desperate circumstances. And they were, they were denuding the land, all the forests, and they were just taking everything and moving the people. So, you know, they gradually move them out of the, you know, the southeast and, and east. And there re there's remnants of people still there today, and they show up, you know, like, Penobscot and all these tribes that were on the east. Uh, but, you know, the, it was just devastating. And they pretty soon they were tolerated. You can, as Mar Thurgood, Mar as the marshal, the uh, Supreme Court justice, you know, you, you can, well, you can have your land right now, but then eventually we own it. You know, you'll have to give up title. And there was, so... The whole concept of owning land was foreign, and these are just places where you lived and shared. So it just went right across the country, the same death, sword, <laughs> immigration. <laughs> it's destroying everything. Uh, and the miners were coming. Like, so in the Northwest, it's just uh, amazing to me the way the people still are. They are still hospitable. Cardinal way of living for them. And open. If you're, if you're not obnoxious and you want to learn and you're not aggressive and dominating, you're welcome. You know? And they share what they have. And so it's, a, it's their main way of, of being on the earth is sharing that way. It's a very wide circle. And so how ironic it is that, that this gesture is taken as a weakness and manipulated. So you have in Seattle, you have, uh, you, know, you know, they sort of tolerate them a little bit as the city is exploding and all these ships coming in and spewing smoke out of their stacks and all that stuff. And, and they're starting to change the environment and, and uh, cut down all the trees. And, and these people are there and, and eventually they're told, even though some of them worked on Seattle building houses for white people, um, they're told they all have to leave. There's, they can't be here anymore. They're not welcome here anymore. So they go out, they push them out towards Suquamish and Muckleshoot, um, south and west. So it's just uh, amazing to me <laughs> that they still, held, they still hold who they are and they don't pay back. Like some of the tribes are doing really well. Uh, my buddies, like at Tulalip, for instance, grew up without shoes, no running water, never knowing if they're going to have any food. They were poor, materially poor in many ways, just so poor. And, and they couldn't go to the neighboring town because they weren't wanted there. And the students weren't wanted in the church, in that town, you know. Didn't want to see Indians. You know, they were some like a lesser, they weren't, they're lesser human beings somehow. And they, that's what they grew up with. These are guys my age. They grew up that way. And of course they, you know, they get into fights and they get into trouble and stuff. But uh, nowadays it's, we've had this renaissance in, in, the, in their, you know, in the reclaiming their life ways and centralizing that in their lives. And, and the church is in there somewhere. Uh, so we're just in that process and the tribes are developing economies because they lost fishing, which was devastating. So they're developing new economies. How do they treat the neighboring? How do they treat the neighbors? Total kindness. Hmm. Even though uh, with the Dawes Act in 1900, where they opened up the reses to settlers, which was absolutely the last nail. 
you know, because then you destroyed them. And uh, so that, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the Congress. And you're destroying these people. And even though the reses are all pockmarked with all these owned by white people there, and then, and then there's Indian parts, and sort of like a quilt. And uh, even so, they're very kind. They're very kind. And they, 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 the neighboring town, they, they, they give what they can, you know, to help them out. So I, I find it so staggeringly ironic that that kind of holiness and wholeness is treated as a weakness mm. by uh, the colonial invasion. That these people are hospitable and kind and generous. And they were. And then suddenly they lose everything. Everything. Their land. They lose everything. They give them a little piece and then they keep shrinking whatever they gave them. They used to. Then they cut it up again. So in spite of all that, they still are who they are. They're kind and generous, loving. These are the other. You know, these are people considered less. I find it extremely ironic. <laughs> because to me, that's the highest. Uh, even one of the anthropologists on the east side was working with a tr tribe I knew very well, San Puel, in Puelca, and uh, some of my uh, tears teachers there. And he had written early on in, uh, I don't know, early 1900s, uh, or probably early to mid, he was more contemporary. He said, I have never seen, well, the more I study the culture, I've never seen a culture this, this magnificent. And when Stephen Point, um, Steve Point, no, that's my dear friend from Canada, when Father Point came from France as a, he's a magnificently educated man. He painted pictures, of, he did all, he's a great guy. One of the things he said in his writing early on is, he said, I've never met a more noble people in my life. Because he recognized what they had. And he was there early enough before it, you know, it was just totally wiped, you know, by tried to be eliminated uh, and by every, so many forces, you know. So very, very difficult. Some of the qualities that you mentioned mm -hmm. Uh, like hospitality, kindness, generosity. Yeah. But I'm also thinking about uh, Native American ways of being in, in, in the created world and reverence for that. And seeing that as, as holy uh, seemed to be uh, some of the qualities that we greatly need at this time. Definitely, yeah. I think... Um, their vision, their understanding of the, like where I am, to be specific, you know, when I was with Interior Salish, Nimipu, Nespers, or Coast Salish, uh, the vision is a, a universe is totally alive and communicative, and that we're simply part of we're considered living ones, um, but that's only one form of life, <laughs> that, that we, are, we are one part of all the living ones, and we are totally interdependent. Uh, we don't have separate existence. Uh, to be is to be related, and to be is to become. And we can't become and be related unless we're just totally somehow in a good relationship. So I don't know, <clears throat> for me, uh, the way I've been taught and what I believe is that I don't know of anything higher than to be related in a good way with all living ones. And that includes the water, the mountains, the cedars, all the animals, the fish, the whole created world 
is alive and each second is being born and held by love. So we come from that. Each second we're being born and sustained by mystery, the holy, the chach. It's, it's, um, the holy sustains everything. <laughs> and so you're, every moment then is a revelation uh, of love and wisdom. Wisdom beyond our human wisdom. <laughs> As Bob Joe used to say, the, you know, the, the Holy One, he, he, he doesn't think like us. <laughs> we, can't, we can't think like him either. It's just, it's too much of uh, what's going on. And so we're simply on this journey together and it's, it's upheld by every living one that went before us you know, or we wouldn't be here this moment. And, and this, the, our life unfolds as it unfolds. And the main thing is to walk in a sacred way on the earth together, together. I don't know of anything higher than that because living in that manner, it creates harmony and joy for all living ones and concern and care and always with full consciousness of the world unseen, which is totally alive also. So it's, it's so beautiful in the Coast Salish way, the way they acknowledge nobility and goodness. And if you're standing up and speaking and they want to acknowledge you, as you've said something meaningful or good, they'll just raise their arms to you. Just, or they'll acknowledge your song your word, your song, the way you carry yourself in the world. So it's like this. But it's also acknowledging all that you've come from, all, all the living ones that have made this moment possible, and then the ones who await you. So the beloved are with us. <laughs> so I mean, it's an acknowledgement of all of it all at once, and the holy, the mystery, the creator, what is unnameable, really, that holds it all together each second. So to live in this manner, I think, is the highest of all. And I know of no higher value or meaning than that in my life. And that's what they have tried to teach me, <laughs> the folks. Uh, you know, we have titles and status and honors and and all that, you know, we just think that's so nice and important. And it sort of works, uh, but it's not anything like this vision where there's a levelness to it. That, and in a certain sense, we can't separate ourselves <laughs> out of it. You know, we're in it. And there, the spirituality is not so anthropomorphic as the European legacy, Greek legacy, European legacy, um, <clears throat> it's all morphic. <laughs> it's like we're simply part of all life that's going on this moment in this world and the world to come. And we're not separated out. I noticed um, in the iconog iconography, uh, when I was visiting in Paraguay and sawing early, that was work in 1600 by Jesuits, and how I would look at, they'd save some things from destruction uh, because they, Jesuits were wiped out <laughs> along with the people. Um, but they're still, the people are still there, and the Jesuits are still there. But this, they'd save some things. And I noticed what the European Jesuits bring is their own iconography. So you have Jesus at the cross, you have Mary, you have Ignatius. Uh, and, I said, and I looked at them and I thought, well, a lot of these were made by native artists because they were better craftsmen than the Jesuits by a long shot. So they would carve all this stuff, beautiful woodwork and paint, you know. They liked doing this. So, but then I noticed, uh, I, after a while, I noticed that around the borders <laughs> was all this plant life, 
And at first it didn't dawn on me. It's sort of all interwoven hmm. plant life all around, all around. And then I realized as I got to know the people a little bit, that's how they got their stuff because <laughs> they have a tremendous sense of the sacred in plants mm -hmm. and it's part of their way and the medicine of the plants and not just for physical but soul and body and and then in their medicine ways their healing ways it's plants are really central mm -hmm. well i thought well, you know they stuck it in there <laughs> <laughs> but there's always it's not anthrop anthropomorphic or anthropocentric mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. it's all of life mm -hmm. and the human being is just one kind of life and like a one of the Jesuit philosophers once, we, uh, they, we have, they, he was saying, you don't really believe, Pat, do you, that the eagles are equal, equal to you, you know, as a human being. Do you really? You know, like that's absurd. I said, I don't even think about it that way. I just know I need the eagle and the eagle needs me. <laughs> it's not that I'm above it mm -hmm. or below it, mm -hmm. or the orca. Take any of these great beings, you know. Well, we need each other dearly. And luckily for us, the orcas love us so much. <laughs> they love human beings. So uh, it's, it's a reciprocal mm -hmm. relationship. Mm -hmm. And therefore, so poignant now that we've destroyed the water and the air that makes life possible. Um, and I, I feel like the tribes have adapted, 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 trying to keep up with things so they could stay here in a good way. And, and now they're the front lines, I think, on the environment, absolutely front line, because their vision is very wide, the importance of all living ones. Mm -hmm. And they've held, they've held that. So now they're the front line, and they have to, to keep fighting <laughs> keep in fighting. the sense that there are projects that yes. that uh, would affect the environment yeah. Uh, context, yeah and that they are they're standing against those in some they, places they stand context. they stand with their bodies and mm -hmm. and with their souls and then they cuz they're really adroit at, at combat in that regard they prepare for years and years to win in court mm -hmm. you have to win in court you have to win with the Army Corps. And especially when you're dealing with oppressive administrations on the state level or federal level mm -hmm. who just want to destroy everything. Well, the tribes have treaties so they can push, push back. Mm -hmm. And they push back, but they have to win in court. And, uh, and they lose a lot, mm -hmm. but they win some. And they, they saved us from having coal dumped all over the north part of the, the Salish Sea, which would have ruined fisheries and ruined water, <laughs> ruined the air. Uh, and they won in court mm. with the Army Corps. And that day was ecstatic when I went up there. I've never, I said I could die now because they won. They pushed back. They saved the whole thing for us. I mean, the Sierra Club and all the environmental groups were pushing, you know, they knew that was bad. So they had allies, but they have to win in court. They got to be in law. They have to win or they'll, they'll come in and just take it. Yeah. So. You know, m moments like this, and that, what you're describing, make me think of that line, uh, the stone that has been rejected has become the cornerstone. I never thought of that. That yes. That, that there's there's a, a very profound sense in which the native ways of being, yeah. maybe, you know, could uh, are so needed. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 kind of ways that you've been sharing with us. Uh, yes. that, that you've learned about. Um, I think that's a, that's a beautiful connection. Cause that's the mystery of it. Mm -hmm. It's it's the mystery of it. Yeah. Um, so could you say something about how the Indigenous Peoples Institute here at mm -hmm. Seattle University uh, got started? <clears throat> well, I, when I got here, I wanted to look for Indigenous students here because I was lonely. And uh, 
so I found some, you know, a few. <laughs> and and then we had little meetings and stuff and, 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 and just seeing if, if they wanted to show themselves and organize and be a presence. Because I thought it would be good if they were a presence. <laughs> and they hadn't been organizing like that. Uh, the Native students that were here were just part of the, the very multicultural setup here. So I thought, well, that would be good. And then I always had this dream of honoring the, the wisdom that's the oldest wisdom here on these lands and waters, among all these living ones. There's a very old wisdom, thousands, beyond time, beyond time. And that wisdom is still here. The teachings are still here. And the ceremonies are still here, thank God. They had to go underground for so many years for fear of persecution. But now they're up and they're strong, all the longhouse ways, Siawan or Skalalitut. And um, I thought, why So we honor all the other spiritual ways here very well at the university, which I'm extremely proud of at this university? What about their presence, their teachings, and what they're doing now in the world, the, the original people from here. And, uh, and we just, it was a thought, it was a thought. And, and then marvelous benefactor, Steve and Tricia Trainer, in their living room one night, they said, I, you keep talking about that all the time, about wanting this, on them on an equal honored presence here, their teachings, their wisdom. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, I guess I do, I do. And they said, do you really want to work on that? <laughs> so I said, well, yeah, I would. And so they said, well, we'll back you, you know, we'll back you with a, a big grant if you want to work on that. And so then I, I go to Christina, Dr. Christina Roberts, who's a native professor in the English department, and um, I beg her, because I know, I know it has to come from the people. It has, she has to be in the lead. And she didn't, she was fighting for tenure and just trying to survive all this here, it's hard. And, but I just kept begging her. And when she finished, she got her tenure and we were moving on. Then she said, well, so she, she took it on. And she's great. She's great. She she knows how to work with. She's very well respected now with faculty and administration. And our, our president, Father Steve Sunborn, has been. I went to him first. I said, "What do you think?" You know, and he said, "Well, yeah, it makes sense. You know, it does." And he brought in the provost then and said, "You know, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. But you have to do it. I mean, you can't. I can't just. <laughs> you have to do it." And so very open to it and then but once we got going and then we did some events and and it raises consciousness all the time and we invite people in and and we do things and people of the consciousness and now we have tremendous support which i just am very humble about just faculty administration our president tremendous support for us this effort but we have to do it mm -hmm. They can't do it for us. So Christina's in the lead. Uh, she has a team, and we're trying to raise a couple million. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, uh, we want it to be going on forever, mm -hmm. perpetuity, as long as this is here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm extremely grateful for Steve and Tricia Trainer, and now we're increasing our. We're reaching out to benefactors a lot and doing mm -hmm. fundraisers, and we, it's been overwhelming, the response. Mm -hmm. So it says something really important. I think the people are aware of the people, mm -hmm. and they know they're, they have something in them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember in my early days, it goes right back to my early days, and I'd be sitting there, and I'd look at, an elder sitting there, you know, with the brace and penalty check. And, uh, you know, they don't show you much. They just are there. 
And um, I thought, my God, you know, what's in there? <laughs> what? What is that mystery in them? And I still ask that. I still, I still, I stand in awe of it. There's something in them that is a magnetic to, for me. For others, <laughs> it scares them, or they're the other. They remain the other, or they're terrorized by them. They feel, well, I'm afraid to drive, you know, I'd be living there all these years, I'm afraid to drive through Swinomish. I say, are you serious? Are you serious? <laughs> I mean, the kindest people you'll ever meet in your life, you know, if you're kind and respectable. But uh, it's just awesome because they have this something. It's something they have. Um, More precious than anything. Yeah. And being able to be around it is good. It's just, God, I just, you know, to be with them is the highest honor. And, uh, and that can be the res, it can be the streets. And it's, it's the highest. They, they're here. They're here. And they're here to stay. You know, they tried to erase them. But they, can, they couldn't do it. And they'd still like to. <laughs> they can't do it. They have endurance. Daryl says, Daryl Hilaire from Lummi says, it's the spirit of our ancestors. Indomitable, indomitable spirit. That's, that's, that's probably as close as you might get <laughs> to this mystery. <laughs> and like you had mentioned before, it's so odd because they're so persecuted and ignored and vilified and ridiculed. God, what they've been through. And yet, they're here. Yeah. <laughs> and getting well, stronger. <laughs> yeah. Well, Pat, thank you so much mm -hmm. for sharing with us, as you always do, from your heart and sharing with us the ways that the, the people that you've come to love and mm -hmm. who love you have, have changed you uh, and the wisdom that they offer uh, for our time. Uh, thank you for your life and your vocation. <clears throat> And uh, maybe mostly thank you for your friendship. Yeah. Love you, brother. Love you, bro. And thank you. Thank you for your kindness and your great questions and being willing to go through this. <laughs> and being willing to do this. And I just pray that our conversation will inspire somebody in a good way. Mm. It helped the people somehow. Mm. And... Uh, it's a big honor to be here with you. Yeah. Amen. Big, big time. <laughs>